So I've had a customer contact me that um, wants a sub box built. So I just figured in this video, I'll just take you on the process of how I design and build a subwoofer box. All right, so the first thing that I do when I'm um, getting in and designing a subwoofer enclosure is I start with the subwoofer um, TS Promins. So I go into um, Basebox Pro, that's the program that I use for um, box calculations. And I fill out all the um, TS parameters, so free air resonance, all that sort of thing. Um, and then I get an idea of how the sub will perform in each enclosure that I design for. So um, then the next thing I do is go into uh, the box section and fill out all of the the maximum box sizes that I um, or the maximum dimensions that I want to um, have the box take up and the reason I do the maximum is because for, in, in this case of a ported enclosure that is um, if I'm happy for it to take up that sort of size it'll usually play lower um, and louder at a lower frequency if you go a larger box so um, I'll also, if the manufacturer specifies um, a recommended box design, I will put that in and I will compare the two. So compare what the manufacturer's recommended box, how it looks, which is going to, unless they give different responses, some being louder output, some being um, flatter response. So unless it, depending which one it is, you put, well, depending what you're after, depending what, um, what, um, your end goal is with the enclosure, whether you want it to be loud, whether you want it to be flat response, whether you want it to be smooth, all that sort of thing. So I'll put in the specifications that I want and compare them to the manufacturers. And if I'm happy that I'm picking a theoretical graph that's better, then I'll choose that. So in this case, we want it to play pretty flat, um, be a little bit louder in the low, low end and still be able to play down to 24, 25 Hertz, that sort of thing. So. Um, I've done a quick plot here and this is the graph that we've come up with. Um, pretty flat, slight little peak there around 30 hertz. Um, so that'll be all right. That's how I put in um, cabin resonance and stuff. I don't know what resonant uh, frequency the vehicle is at. Windows down and everything, it all changes. But ish, that, I'm going to guess that'll be up around maybe 40. So it'll give another bump again at 40 or so. So this will get even flatter. Um, through here and then yeah it taper off not not too sharp taper off it should play down decently and our tuning for the box um, is at around 28 Hertz now I was aiming for 28 and I've gone ahead and already designed the box so this is actually um, a redo because so I'll go ahead and design a box in base box with the tuning frequency and everything I want, I will go and 3D model the box. Um, and then from the model with all the bracing and that, I will then put the actual volume we've got back into base box and see what theoretical tuning we ended up with. Um, and another note on ports, I've got here for the, uh, the, the size here, I've got two um, slot ports, 90 millimeters by 384 and one point uh, so one 1,025 millimetres long. <coughs> now, lots of people seem to think the port area is the same thing. So whether you have a really skinny port that's really long or a square port or a round port, it's all the same because it's area. Uh, this is incorrect. So in fluid dynamics, there's a term known as the boundary layer. And this is essentially the the friction caused as a fluid flows past um, a surface. So if you have a really long slot port that's say only 20 millimeters um, in one dimension and say four or 500 in the other, you're thinking that's 20 millimeters by 500. Well, it is in theory, but you're passing a fluid through that and you have more surface area due to the really thin and a really long piece that's a big square um, of one side of the port, you have a lot more surface area than you do if it was one continuous round port. Um, so you actually have more boundary layer and 
boundary layer when you start getting into turbulent flow and things, boundary layer gets, depending on what surface um, the port is made of, so if it's really smooth, if it's rough, boundary layer actually increases. So you might think you have a 20 millimeter thick port, you might have three or four millimeters of boundary layer by the time the fluid's passing through it, depending what frequency it's at. <coughs> Excuse me. And in which case now your port dimension is no longer 20 mil, it's now 16, because you've got two layers of that boundary layer each side, or it could even be more, or 15, or you might even get into a really bad turbulence area with really bad boundary layer where it's dropped down to maybe even like 10 millimeters. So you've done all your calculations, worked out for 10 millimeters, up for 20 millimeters by the 500, and now you're at 10. Well, instead of going from a ported box, you're now at a leaky sealed box or just some terrible design where you've got extra long port length for a really skinny port, so you're tuning to something stupid and just not theoretically what you wanted. So not all port areas the same. Just remember that when you're designing a box, try to get a round port if possible or anything close to round, so um, hexagon, anything with more, sh more sides is better. And if you do have to do a slot port, whether it looks better, whether you, you want one, um, try to get that dimension pretty big. Um, you don't want to go too big because it, then it comes into um, yeah, um, vent velocity dropping really, really low. Um, so you, you, you've got to make sure you calculate it right, but don't think port area is equal. That's all I'm trying to say. So um, yeah, so this is tuned to a theoretical of 27.68, which is you know, too precise for the real world scenario, but because the TS parameter is going to change and as the sub breaks in, it's going to change a little bit and whatnot, but theoretically around 28 hertz. Um, so now we can go in and actually design the box in uh, Fusion 360. All right, so we're here in uh, Fusion 360. This is my 3D modeling um, program of choice. And so we start off with um, the dimension of, I start with the dimension of the base for starters. So I'll get the base all designed up um, and do my length or width or depth or whatever you want to call it. Um, and I will actually put these parameters into um, the um, parametric um, parameters. So that way, if I ever update it or change it, the model will just change instantly for me without me having to actually manually go into each sketch. So it's all done through here. So if I change the width, you can see here, if I change the width from 800 fill 40 to 900, the model automatically updates for me. So I don't have to um, keep going back to each individual sketch, whether the base, the sidewall, the, the top or anything and change everything manually, it just does it for me. So we can revert that back to 840 and the model back updates for me. So that's a really good way um, to make changes to your box as you go, because when you get into complicated boxes like sixth orders or fourth orders, and you want to change something because your airspace has changed or your theoretical tuning's gone out because of a brace that you put in, so now you have to change your volume, it's really easy to change on the fly using um, parametric parametric values rather than going to each individual's visual sketch. So I really recommend Fusion for that because it is a really great, powerful tool, free for a hobbyist and really cheap um, plans if you are into 3D modeling. So I suggest getting into it. So from the base all being um, designed up, I go ahead and put the sides up and then the back up or the front. And I basically make the whole enclosure. So. I'll go ahead and design the enclosure like this, like a full box, and, uh, and then put the top on it, and then start designing the actual cutouts for this, the sub and that. So this is where the subwoofer um, cutout dimensions go, and then the ports, the two ports are here with that center divider because I've got a brace running through the whole thing. Um, bracing's a whole other part we'll get to in a second, but basically make the cutouts for the, the tops and the sides. And another reason, I design all my boxes in this manner, um, with the sides being inserted, so everything clamps around the sides. Um, the reason being is I can then route a rabbited edge um, 
around the sides and then when you put them together if you're actually carpeting it then you end up with a nice square insert panel that's even uh, distance all the way around and then you can actually carpet to your side your, all your faces around the corner to that rabbited edge and then you can actually carpet the the insert square edge on its own separate so that's the reason why I designed them as a the sides being sandwiched compared to um, the sides being add-on and the top being squished in or the bottom being squished in or the, the front panels being squished in that's how I designed all mine um, so then we go on to the next few steps which I then start um, developing the port so I'll model up the port dimensions um, well here I've done a double baffle so two layers of um, the top plate just because it's such a big sub this is an 18 inch sub and it's a pride audio uh, 4000 watt RMS so big sub big X movement lots of power heaps of weight so double baffle top which is a no-brainer um, maybe even triple baffle but I have got some pretty big bracing running at all the points where it'll sort of flex and have some weight so we'll see how it goes um, I'd probably actually put more bore bracing in if if um, if there's any issues but we'll, we'll just see how this performs first um, so yeah the from from here the double baffle and I get into actually designing the port so um, modeling up to where you're left with um, if I take this top off wait a second turn the top off and the baffle you can see here we've modeled the port inside the enclosure um, and another thing with port it's not the length of the port as such uh, if you've got a zigzag port some people seem to think that it's the, the full length of the zigzag and then another length of the next zigzag and another length of the it's not it's the the the, um, the length of the center path of the airflow or fluid flow um, so in this case if we turn the side off you can see here your your actual um, length of port is from this very top face right here this very top face it comes down through the cent sorry, center path not through the not the port length here through the center path until it reaches halfway through the um, the port width here between here and here it's halfway and then from there it then shoots all the way to the back of the port at the center not following this length and not following the outside length. The inside length would be too short a port area, a port length, the outside length would be too long of port length. So in theory, you use the center path um, where the majority of the fluid is actually flowing. Um, and yes, air is a fluid. It's, when I say fluid, it's not liquid. Air is a type of fluid. So yeah, design the port up um, and then from here, um, it's just adding um, just some 45 degrees um, guides here because basically when you look, if we go onto our side, if we pick that edge and the face, it's about 90 millimeters distance. Whereas if it was right to the edge, you've actually got a bit of a port transition there. Uh, and this just helps also guide the waves through so you don't get any turbulence spinning as it hits a corner. You want nice smooth transitions. Um, so 45s work really well in corners of the port. I don't worry about them external to the port, um, only within the actual port itself. So if you had four or five bends, you'd want four or five 45 degree guides at each corner. Not, I, I don't worry about them in other parts of the box unless I'm doing a really SQ style box and don't want any sort of, I want everything guided smoothly and that, but in saying that, I don't use ported boxes for that uh, reason anyway um, I'd be more leaning towards some form of sealed box that's a whole other topic of sealed versus ported but there's lots of people that say sealed's better than ported for sound quality which it can be but there's also times where it's not as well depending on how your design is and um, how the sub actually performs so some subs especially smaller subs actually want um, ported boxes compared to larger subs that actually want sealed boxes due to the way they are um, and your um, electromechanical parameters um, sort of determine 
what sort of box it wants, so if it wants sort of if it wants a sealed or a ported um, enclosure. From here, I designed the um, braces. So we move along to where, um, where are we close this off. Move along to where we start putting in some some bracing here to stop um, stop the flexing of the the baffle and the top plate. And this just helps also. This is also actually acts as the divider for the two ports. Two ports. It's one big port, but it's two in um, in terms of um, an audio application. So I've got two ports with the divider in the middle, and then yeah. So from here, I design in the the, um, the center brace, which helps with the the movement um, vertically of the baffle because this is a really long area where there's nothing supporting it so definitely need a baffle in there um, these shapes are definitely not required I have a CNC so I can easily cut these sorts of shapes out and then put them on the route a bit to, to rough it it's just so I don't have big wasted material uh, if you put a big center thing like a center divider like that that was fully solid you're actually going to get weird sort of maybe not in that position but in other parts of the enclosure you're sort of cutting off airflow and changing things so I'll use this with two thicknesses um, as you can see here two thicknesses sorry when they're together two thicknesses here of 80mm MDF and join them together and I'll round one side on both pieces so have a nice big round over and a nice big round over the other way which will allow for smooth airflow um, when it's flowing through this shape this shape's just just a random shape that I come up with just just to help reduce some material where it's not needed. Um, we've still got a full solid piece here and then center pieces here, which actually, you've actually basically got three little braces that are sort of 30 mil by 36 or something like that um, to help support with that vertical movement. Next up, I design another extra brace. Um, I looked at this little bit here. There's nothing holding it here and here, even though the very outside edges are supported. I thought I'll put something in the center, but rather than just the center piece, I'll do a similar sort of thing where we have a brace with some couple of slots through it. And same thing with these, I'll round these over as well, both front and back to help with airflow between them. So one each side, um, and that will allow the sub to be pretty solid. So we've got a center brace here, center brace here, and then two braces at either side. Um, which should be ample enough for this enclosure. Of course, all these, the tops and the bottoms are all going to be pinned and, <coughs> excuse me, uh, glued and nailed, so um, they won't move. It's just through these open spaces where there's decent sort of um, unsupported um, length. So from here, now that I've got the actual design done, I'll put in these little um, end dividers, that's what I call them, and this is just for the fusion modeling software to cap that off because basically when you have a vent you can't include the airspace of the actual vent itself in the um, box volume so your box volume is the total volume and then your actual volume that the subwoofer is using is the volume less or your bracing less all of your 45 chamfers or your 45 supports um, and less your subwoofer displacement, and then finally less your port area. So this whole volume here um, can't be taken into consideration when you're talking volume for the subwoofer. So I put a cap here to divide it, and then another one on top. These are just little one millimeter um, plates that just sort of are a sol solid model. They can be less than one millimeter, I just, I just make them that. And this allows just for some extra, like if you put like a little bit of corking or something, try and seal up the edges, which I usually do in most of my boxes. This sort of allows for a little bit extra volume. So your box is slightly a little bit bigger than what this says it is, but this allows for a few other things like that. Um, and then what I'll do is create a boundary fill, which essentially, if I go, uh, where are we? Uh, volume, this boundary, if I isolate this, that's essentially the volume that the subwoofer enclosure would see um, and from here you can um, go into your properties and you can actually see what size volume this shape is 
Um, and this is really handy because once you've designed all of your bracing, you're essentially using all those tools to cut this theoretical air volume. And once you have the theoretical air volume, you can go back into Basebox and update your model in here with your actual volume. So you can get this number here, this 8.63. This was originally, because it's only an 840 millimeter box, 840. I had a theoretical of 28 Hertz and 8.441 cubic foot after displacement. But after doing this little model and working all this out, I actually have 8.6, um, whatever it was before, 853. 8.63, I think it's 8.637 or something is what the theoretical um, volume is of the box. So you can then update your model here and compare the two graphs if it's drastically different. This isn't that much different, it's changed the frequency drop a little bit, a little bit lower than it was, and our volume's gone up. So, um, but then you can yeah, plot, plot your graph again against, compare it against your um, theoretical of what you originally designed to what your updated model is. And this is once again where you're um, parametric um, dimensions here can really come in handy because you can just change them and it'll update your airspace and update everything for you as you go so if I change that to only one meter you can see the, the total airspace volume changes if I change it to 1100 it's back to what it was so really handy tool um, I definitely recommend it if you're getting into any sort of modeling and especially box modeling um, definitely handy to have it's definitely not needed it's but it definitely helps with comparing your actual design to your theoretical and then when you're adding all your bracing and stuff it can be sort of hard to calculate some of those shapes so this is a really handy tool and um, now let's lay out this model uh, and get it all laid out ready for the CNC now this step you wouldn't have to take if you don't have a CNC you can literally just go to each um, each piece that you've got and measure it so you can or you can actually send this to a drawing and draw up all scale dimension drawings of each panel um, you can say yeah I need to cut a bit 278 by uh, 150 and then put some couple slots in the middle or something like that um, so yeah definitely a tool that I would recommend um, using so from now I'm going to go ahead and lay out all of these into a layout model instead of a 3d model and then we can um, put it onto the CNC table and cut it all out. So you can see here we um, have the layout. Um, oh, we have the model all laid out in a, a flat pack essentially. Um, so this here represents the sheet that I can cut. So it's a 2400 by 1200 sheet. Um, so yeah, ready to do all of the cam processing now to tell the um, router where to move and where to cut. Um, and all of this, like I said before, it's all parametric now. In modeling a layout model which is this model here that I've just done in laying a layout model and then having a um, 3d model anything I change in the 3d model will automatically update in the layout model and then also having that um, in a parametric sense we can change say this subwoofer cutout we can change it from 453 we can change it to 200 and you'll see it all live updates both the 3d model here and also the layout so and then all of that is then linked to um, the CNC side of it which is cam operations so if you change something here um, it automatically updates not only the model 
but auto updates the cam profile so your CNC will know what to do all by just changing the values in the parametric um, parameters so really handy to do um, so now we will go ahead and cut all this out on the CNC well program it all up so we've got to tell the tool to cut the inside of this or this bit first and then cut that um, so a little bit of a time um, time taking process but it's heaps easier than trying to cut all this by hand because it's quite a few pieces three sheets of MDF you know if you're cutting all this out and getting everything accurate and that it's it's, it's time consuming but that's why CNC's cost so much money because they're really handy tools so we'll get in and um, tell the CNC where to cut and what to cut first and where to put tabs and whatnot to hold everything and then um, we'll take it over to the CNC machine and get this thing cut out Alright, so um, all of that's now, I've got the tool paths all sorted, um, well, which is the cam side of things. So um, you can see here we've got all the different cuts. So that's the first cut, second and third. That's three different sheets I've got to load onto the um, CNC to cut it. Um, and then you've got each individual tool path. So everything in blue is the tool path. So it does the inner bits and then the outer of those and that one. And the inner circle and then the outer. Um, and when it's cutting it cuts through and I've left little tabs um, you can see for example here so that blue lines where the tool path where the um, end of the tool goes or the middle of the tool so the tool comes down here and then it lifts up and what that does when you um, when you cut it it leaves a slight bit of material so that way it doesn't snap free and as you're making the very final cut it tries to like grab and move and stuff it it's still solid to the sheet, which is screwed down. It's just, they leave a little, little bits. So you just snap those off and then clean them up on the, um, with a flush trim bit on the router. So if I go into simulate here, um, and then run to the end, we can see, flip loads, wait a second. That one, simulate, run to the end. You can see, everything there that's cut and then you can see these little tabs um, just here so this is this is the bottom under, under view of the sheet but you can see everything that's white so obviously that's where it's cut and then it leaves these little little tabs there um, which can just be broken off um, quite easily with a chisel or um, pry tool and then yeah clean up the little little knob bits that are left on the router so I'll take this out to the uh, router, load up a sheet and start cutting it out. So all the pieces are cut out for the sub box now so um, I've gone ahead and cleaned up the edges and got rid of all those little tabs um, that were holding the sheet down so now I can go and put the roundovers on the um, 
bracing and port entrance and um, anything else like the 45 degree cuts on the um, the guides going into the port or the, the 45 degree corners um, put them in and then we can go ahead and start assembling the actual box <laughs> There we go, sub box is all built. So um, hopefully that gives you a bit of an understanding of what it takes to build a sub box. Um, that's how I personally build them anyway. Um, and yeah, if this was getting wrapped, um, the edges, as I said earlier, because the um, edges are all compressed and sandwiched in, I'd normally do a um, rabbited groove around the outside so that the carpet can fold into that groove and then the other, the, um, other angled carpet can go over the top and fold into the groove as well. So you end up with a nice little seam along the edges. But yeah, this box is all done. Um, I can't actually take it off the bench to show you um, on the ground what it looks like because it's too heavy for me just to lift. So um, I'll do my best to just take some footage now while it's up on the bench. <laughs>